invitation. I am really happy to to be part of this uh, web um, team and have the opportunity to share a little bit things that I have known so far. I don't know anything, everything, but um, I think I'm really happy to to share a little bit things um, that I have learned so far. Um, so today, as the title says, it's a brief introduction, and the reason for said brief is because, um, well, reactive programming could be really big topic, and actually, if we start to integrate libraries and other things that you can go and study a lot of time. Actually, I found a couple of really good books where you can read about it um, and you can just learn a lot of things. And so that's the reason I just decided to set, to put the brief because I hope at least go to see a little bit things about uh, reactive programming. And I am using RxJS uh, as one of the libraries that I use more on my daily basis. And another feature that has been integrated from Angular, um, I am actually most of my experiences with Angular, and that's the reason I decided to integrate also signals, which is a cool new feature that Angular integrated recently uh, for the latest version of Angular, and also use the power of reactive programming. So I wanted to say a little bit about reactive programming, uh, like uh, just not talk about the theory of reactive programming, I would like also to share a little bit like uh, using a library or using a reactive way to programming uh, with examples of how to use it. And that's the reason I decided to use uh, RxJS and Signals as an example for that. Um, so the agenda uh, really quickly is just an introduction about reactive programming. Um, some of the RxJS, how to use it, and also some additional features for reactive programming. There are a lot of things that you can use, but for today, I'm going to just uh, give a little introduction about NGRx, just a, an introduction, and signals uh, a little bit more uh, wide, uh, or a little more detailed explanation about signals. Um, so let's go with reactive programming first. Uh, so what is reactive programming? So I'm going to make use of the definition um, of reactive programming. So it is said like a reactive programming is a declarative programming paradigm to work with asynchronous data streams. So an application generates streams of data and events of, over its lifetime. So an application during the duration of an application when it's just functioning or working, um, we have different data events. Um, and a program is considered to be reactive because it responds to those changes. Um, so going a little bit further with this explanation about declarative programming, um, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with this the description of programming paradigms uh, such as declarative. I think the best way to maybe explain what is declarative is using the reference for the opposite, which is imperative programming. And imperative programming, it's focused on how to prog the program should work. What is the expected, like uh, what are the steps? So if, for example, I have a function that um, has the result of a summary of some uh, of two numbers, I am uh, imperative saying how to do that operation. But in difference with the, or the, in other uh, case, for example, for declarative programming, we have functional programming, which is um, a way of declarative programming, and it helps to focus on what is the uh, intention of the program. So instead of just saying how to do something, I am saying how I, or what is the, the goal for that program, what I am trying to achieve. So instead of saying do this and do, and do this other thing, I am saying uh, the purpose of this function is this specifically. So that's the way to uh, write code in a declarative way. Um, so to work, um, going a little bit further with the what is asynchronous data streams, I wanted to use uh, examples of asynchronous events. What are asynchronous events or examples of asynchronous events? We have DOM events, API calls, WebSockets, server, server events, 
uh, which are pretty common on our daily basis. Uh, we have API calls for getting data from an application. Uh, we have DOM events from the user, like a mouse events, um, keyboard events. So we are uh, having a lot of asynchronous data. And why they are asynchronous is because they don't happen so we have a timeline and they happen in different moments of time. Um, I would say like uh, this graphic represents this, this example a little bit better. If I have a timeline, let's say that this is the period of time of the application, I have a different events happening during the application, but not one after another. That would mean that that event is synchronous. But instead of that, we have events happening during different periods, different, during different moments of time. So for example, if the user clicks something, later just interact with a form, later uh, put something uh, like a touch event in, on another uh, component or another field, that's different events that are happening during the the time duration of the application. So a data streams is the sequence of those asynchronous events during the duration of the application. Um, let's go a little bit further with this. Um, so this is, I, I graphed this pretty cool graphic from, um, it's simple, but I think it explains a lot about reactive programming. Uh, so I grabbed it for um, Andrew Stoltz. Sorry if I don't pronounce it correctly. Um, so this one uh, is an introduction about reactive programming that I think is really good if you want to go for it and try to understand a little bit better the reactive programming. Um, so we have the same timeline and we have an example here about different events. So we have, for example, this is a click event represented by some value. So we have an event happening on the timeline. So we have different events over the time of the application, we could have also an error because I don't know, like a, let's say that this is an API call. An API call fail. So let's say that there was an error uh, asynchronously. Uh, we get that information about the error here. And this is the end of the time or the completed state for this uh, stream of events, which indicates me that the stream has finished or has completed, so it's not going to emit anymore. This is the basic structure of observables. Uh, so if we capture these emitted events, uh, we, we didn't need to take into account that these events are captured asynchronously of all of them. So we need to capture, if we want to capture them, we usually capture those events and we attach a function to those events to execute something. Uh, so doing that operation is like that. doing the, the listening to the stream is called subscribing. And the functions that we are defining are observers. So when we subscribe to our stream, uh, we are like, a, subscribing like a listening for those changes, we have a function that it's executed after some event happened and that is called the, um, like a, the function for subscribing, we have the observable and the object that is being observed is the observable. Um, this precisely is the, or in other words, is the observer design pattern. Um, so reactive programming relies a lot of its, I don't know, like a theory or all the work that it, do, it does is on observables, although it's not necessarily using observables in all the cases. I'm going to share an example of that, but it behaves in the similar logic. We have subscription to different events, asynchronous events, and we are reacting to those changes. I'm going to give like a, what data types are um, like a, if we go and see this plane, we have four types of data. One of them are sing, single and synchronous. We have also sing, single and asynchronous collection of data or uh, that is synchronous. And the same way we have collection of data that is asynchronous. What kind of data we have that is just single and synchronous? just a simple variable. So we have the primitives as numbers, uh, strings, 
booleans, they represent one single value at the time that they have something assigned and they are synchronous data. They don't, they don't happen like a synchronous link in, in events. For example, for so synchronous data that are represented as single values, we have promises. So we have a promise that in some time of the time of yeah of time is going to be resolved or rejected. So when the resolution of that promise happens, we have the result of that data that we are expecting for. But that happens just once. Although this is asynchronous, this is just going to happen once. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, I can hear so, you. Yes, yes, I'm hearing. I'm hearing. I, I hear. I can hear you. <clears throat> Aku, do uh, you have any uh, questions? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, fine. I, I, I have kids at home because. Uh, I, I'm sorry. One of them is a little bit sick, but now I can. Do you Pavel? have any questions? Yeah, Pavel, do you have a question for us or it's a mistake? Okay. Yes. Sorry, I think it's a mistake. Okay, I didn't. I did. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> no worries, that happens. So let's go with the collection of data of uh, synchronous collection of data. We have arrays. Uh, so we have different event, different data. Um, sorry, a collection of data that happens synchronously because that, that is not happening in different periods of time. If we get the array, we get, we get all of them all synchronously. But if we see observables, we have different collections of data that happens in a period of time. So it, in contrast of promises, we have an asynchronous event that is happening. We get different data during a different period of time, but this in different uh, in contrast with promises, we have more than one value. Um, that's pretty much the difference from both of them, but there are different, more differences. But if you want to say, look at what is the difference between a promise and observable? Well, we have observables, we have collections of data instead of just one single value. So why should we use reactive programming? I think uh, we have a lot of reasons to use it. Um, I have put just some of them that are pretty important or I don't know, like a, for me, it's important to use is asynchronous and event driven. That means that, react, uh, that means that reactive programming is really well suited for handling asynchronous operation and event driven programming. It provides a structured and composable way to work with asynchronous data streams. So that makes easier to handle like events, network requests, user interactions that give us like a better structured way to do it. And it's really connected with the simplified- Oh, sorry, no, I, I was again muted. Uh, yeah. I'm sure, you, do you have any question <laughs> or it's okay? <laughs> okay, just let, let us know if you have any questions. Um, Okay, so asynchronous and data and event-driven uh, way to manipulate data that is reactive help us also to have a reactive state management. And the state management is the data that is being used on the application. We can we can react to those changes and create the state in a better organized way. So that means that we also have data flow control and also have some code reusability because we are. We are focusing the way that we react for different changes. Um, and we are reusing a lot of code in a lot of ways. And we also have error handling and resilience. We have also the opportunity to test really easy uh, those observables. And we have another powerful thing, which is concurrency and parallelism. Parallelism, sorry. <laughs> so that means that uh, we can handle concurrency uh, more efficiently by leveraging operators like may, merge, concat, switch map. Uh, and that means that we can use a lot of a synchronous event in just one single place. Um, I'm going to explain that a little bit better with the a little bit explanation of RxJS. Um, Let's go to a little example. I want to see, like, uh, I don't want to talk a lot 
of theory because sometimes it's just overwhelming. So I want to use an example from Angular, which is pretty cool picture that Angular has. It's reactive forms, but I want to go first with the definition of reactive forms. So reactive forms, uh, the definition said like uh, use an explicit and immutable, immutable approach to managing the state of a form at a given point in time. It change to the form state returns a new state. That is important to know that the form is not being mutated over the changes, which is like a preserving the, the like the functional programming about mute, don't mutate the state that which maintains integrity of by integrity of the model between changes. Reactive forms are built around observable streams where form inputs and value are provided as a streams of input values, which can be accessed synchronously. Uh, so we have like, a, we are having, like we are getting data that is asynchronous, but we are manipulating or operating over that information synchronously. I'm going to just share this little example here. Uh, so I have created an example in code with a reactive form. So the way for, for doing this is pretty simple and easy on Angular. We use the form builder, which helped me to, to create like a form group in a release, um, I, it's like a syntactic, syntactic sugar to create forms because actually what I do is create a form and I pass a, an, an object and tell what are the controls for that object, um, what are the initial values for them, and just creates a form group uh, from that form. Um, so we create a form group here, and I just wanted to show this example here, just like how you can see it. I just created this one and I defined the initial values. And I wanted to share like a if now uh, or the power to using reactive programming. We know that normally user interacts with the application, like a change something, and I want to react to those changes. We don't know where those uh, interactions are going to happen but we know that we want to react to them. And that's the power of reactive programming. We are reacting to the interaction of user. If I don't react to that, this total is not going to be updated as I am expecting, or like I need to, once the user start to interact, I want to recalculate the total for this example. So this is this, the, if I want to say this is value one plus value two, I want to show the total. If I don't react to those changes, what is going to happen is that this total is not going to be updated, which is not the, the ideal for us. So I wanted to show another example here, like a contrast for another one using reactive programming, uh, which is a username. We want that, once the user site starts to type in, we want to react to those changes. And I'm going to show uh, how we are going to interact for username. I don't know, like I start to type in my name. I see, or if you can see on the console, uh, I don't know if you can see it big enough. Sorry, if I'm going to just give it a little bit more uh, size. Uh, so if you can see, the form is reacting to every keyboard event here, and it's, type, it's showing me what is the, the, the value that the user is typing in. That is really powerful for forms because I am reacting to those changes. And I'm going to show you how I create that reactivity over the form. We created, I created a form that is called user form, and I am subscribing to those changes so in this case, the form is, or like the field is behaving like an observable. I am subscribing to that of observable and I am observing those changes and I am reacting to them. Um, I'm going to explain with RxJS and other operators that we can use here, but just for an example here, I just wanted to show an example of um, real life of reactive forms. Um, we can do a lot of things here, like I can use this value that it, I am getting, and I don't know, let's say like a, in the example for calculation, I just like a, once the user starts to type in value or change the value to, I want to make the result 
of the total. And I can totally manipulate that, change that, update that, that state from the controller or the, yeah, from the controller of the application that help us to create a really like a flow of data in a, in a, in a way that we are manipulating the things in one single place and not in both places. Um, I am going, I don't want to touch a lot of a lot of that topic because that's another one and that could make me go a little uh, so much further with the presentation, but I just giving a little things what is happening with reactive forms. Um, so now an example with RxJS, uh, I am using RxJS and actually that is really, uh, when you start an application in Angular, actually that's one of the things that you have by default when you set up your application from scratch. Uh, that's a library that use, uh, that help us to make reactive programming using observables and enables us to, to work with asynchronous data um, to transform, combine, and manage those streams. Um, so the key features in RxJS are observables and operators. And with operators, we have uh, different types of operators. We can have error handling those uh, errors that are happening for operator for observables. And I'm going to explain those things a little bit further with the next uh, presentations. So going with subscriptions, uh, we have in RxJS, I already mentioned the term uh, about subscription. So in RxJS, it represents the same that I already have talked so far. Um, so it represents the connection between observable and observer. So it allows me to know uh, what is the stream that I am observing and how I am working with that events that I'm, I am receiving from the observer element. Um, and we receive those values there. I have a little example here uh, of code. I just have an interval um, here. I am observable. I generated an observable, uh, which gener it generates an event in certain period of time. So I am creating a subscription to that observable and I am logging that value here. So we are creating a, a, a like an event uh, every one second, we are subscribing to those changes. We are logging that error, uh, sorry, those events we are logging in here. And after some time, I just unsubscribing to those changes. So always we can have the way to unsubscribe as we can subscribe to something. It's similar to as YouTube channel works. You can subscribe and every time that the YouTuber uploads a new video, we get a notification of that um, of that new video. And if I don't want to follow that YouTuber anymore, I just unsubscribe and I don't get more events from, from that YouTuber. It's similar uh, a scenario like that. So similar that we already said, uh, the relation between an observable is by subscribing to that, uh, to that uh, sorry, to that observer and I am creating a subscription and I am having a an, an function that is called the observable or the observable function that it's executed after some event happening the observer element or data stream. And I am reacting to those things. Um, so we have another uh, example of code like uh, I have an observer and the observer has three events. The next, which indicates that a new event happened, the error that when an error occurred on the observer and the complete event that tells me that the observer is no longer going to uh, generate new events anymore. For operators, uh, we have um, a really cool functionalities here. We have different types of operators, but uh, some of them are creation creation operators that helps me to create new observables from various sources. Um, so I can have like a, a source of events and the operators never mutate the, the stream of events. I get in a new observable uh, with a different ways to operate, to like uh, generate new information. Um, so for creation, as in its, nom its name says, 
creations create something from another thing or of another thing. It, this, these names help us to understand a little bit better what they are intention for, what the intention of the, those operators. A little example here, we have the of operator, which says from one to three sequence, create a new observable. And it's generating, I have a synchronous data here that is transforming to observable that is going to emit one, two, three in different periods of time. So if we see the input, the output here, or like just like a printing the, the value that we are getting, we have one, two, three, those events are happening asynchronously and the complete event once I finish all the events. That is helpful if I want to create um, some sort of data that happens asynchronously. That is not really common to see it being used just like that, but you are going to find it in some examples there. So the other one, which is more common or like the one that you maybe use more is transformation operators. These transformation change the immediate values, but they keep uh, creating new observables. They don't mutate the origin data. So if I am subscribed to an, an stream events and I am grabbing that information, doing some transformation, that's happened in a new observable. If there are several, um, like a subscription to the same source, I'm just doing that, like how operation is being done uh, without mutating the origin uh, event. Um, so these ones uh, help me to transform that data in the way that I need it. Um, so for example, we have map, filter, take, skip, they have a lot of them and they could help you with the with the different purposes of the thing that you need to do with that subscription. Uh, so there is a little example and that this is the most common one, the filter. So the filter helps you to remove certain data that you don't need from the data stream. So for example, in this case, I am filtering all the elements that are not, um, uh, if I, sorry, I'm not sure if it's all, Sorry if I just don't remember the word, but I'm removing the, the other elements that are not fulfilling this uh, condition in this case. So once I apply this filter in this case, I am removing from the data stream that I'm getting into another stream. So I am just seeing the output is zero, two, four. I don't receive one, three, because they are not, uh, not odd. <laughs> Um, subjects. This is another powerful uh, tool or, I don't know, core things that RxJS offer, offers. So subjects is a special type of, of observable that allows me to multicast to multiple observers. So it has the functionality to be observable and observer at the same time. One important thing that I totally forgot to mention is that an observable is like a lazy component, uh, lazy state if nothing subscribed to the observable or to the observer i think like a, it just like a, it's not going to emit anything you need to subscribe to that in order to emit values so with subjects we have something that behaves in both ways so if we if we subscribe to that subject we are going to get immediately the value actually there are different kinds of subjects. We have different uh, L, uh, types of them for different data manipulation. So there is a little example for a subject, a simple subject. We create a new subject here. We subscribe to those changes to that subject and we are logging the subscriber. For example, I have created a subscription here and I have created another subscription here. They are two things independent. independent. So I am logging the subscription here. So the subject here is emitting changes. So it's saying, okay, now I said hello. And later I say RxJS is awesome. So the subscriber one, which was subscribed first said, okay, the, the event, the first event is hello. The subscriber one said, RxJS is awesome. And the second one is also saying the same thing. So that means that all the subscriptions are getting the same data and they are happening in 
at the same time for both of them. They are operating over that information. Um, let's go with the next one. I don't want to stand a little bit of subjects. There are a lot of things of subjects that I forgot to mention. And we have different types of subjects. Uh, the most or the most common for me is behavior subject because it helps me to create the information that I can want to reuse or just extend for different things. And, and I'm going to explain that better on the example that I have. Um, so I'm going to show you that in real time application. Uh, some additional features for reactive programming. We have an NGRX, which I will call like a, um, all the reactive programming and RxJS on steroids, <laughs> like a powerful tool. There are a lot of people that don't like at all NGRX because the complexity could be a really big, big but once you get used to an NGRX, I think it's really useful and powerful. I'm not going to show today the example for NGRX. I use it in my current application, but one important thing to understand about it is that you can use it in an application more robust where you want to share the state between different components and you want to manage it in a better way. So going with the structure of this NGRX of how NGRX create the state or manipulate the state, we have a store where the state is saved and we have selectors for grabbing information from that store. So I am not taking information directly to the store. I use selectors for that purpose. I send I send the information to the select from the selector to the component. And if something happens, I want to like a change a data into the store and just dispatch an action. That action is going to be listened by effects and reducer. So the effects, um, gen it's like a side effect, like a, I don't know, like a, I need to grab some data. The component said dispatch an action like a, I need user data and this action is going to say, okay, this happens. The effect is going to listen for that action happening. Uh, it's going to make the call to the service, get the data, uh, create a new action, say like uh, I fetch the data correctly, and the reducer is going to say, okay, this is our, these are the actions that happen over the time. This is this, the way that I manipulate the store. The reducer is the only one who change and modify the store. That helps us to create like a single data flow of data, preventing like a mutation of data and single responsibility over the man manipulation on the store. Um, so I think that's the powerful of things or of NGRX. And signals. So signals, um, it's a really cool new feature. I, I really enjoy to understand a little bit more about signals when I saw it first on Angular. So signals is a wrapper around a value values that we already know, like a single data collection of data. And I, I wrap them and modify, like um, make them a little bit more complex uh, data structure to react to those things. So can be defined as the union of a variable and a change notification. It always has a value. It is synchronous although it reacts from for asynchronous events and signals nature is reactive and is called reactive primitive. So Angular is creating a new primitive, which is which they call reactive. And it's not a repl replacement for RxJS and observables for asynchronous operations like API codes. And if you start to see a little bit about signals, what you are going to face is that people is saying like a RxJS is done, with signals or it's going to be fully replaced by, by signals, but you for asynchronous operations, API calls, you are going to still need the power of RxJS and actually operators, a lot of things, you are still going to make use of them. Of them. The benefit for signals is that you don't need to learn complexities from RxJS, all the observable operations, which can be difficult at the beginning. Uh, and you are using the power of reactive programming with signals. And I, that's the example that I want to show today. Um, so we have similar example that we are like a 
example that I show you with the form, I have a value of five, three, and if I just like five plus three, I'm going to have a log of eight. But if I change X to 10 and log Z, what I'm going to see is it's still going to be eight because I am not reacting to that change, similar to the example that I show you with the form. So with signals, if I wrap this value with signal and I am have a new signal that is called computed, I am reacting to those changes either from X or either from Y. I just react into that. And when I set a new value for X, what I'm going to see is that Z is new value. So I am reacting to those changes in this case. So important things to take from signals is that we have a calm, uh, this is an example of how we create signals. We have here the signal creation. I just say like a, create a new constant, that constant is signal wrap uh, here, this value of zero. So we have signals are, um, we have, Getter signals have getter functions that helps me to graph that value. How do I call it? Just like a calling a function, I said come and open parenthesis, and I'm going to get the value from that. That's the way to create signals. And if I want to update that signal, we have three things. We have set, update, and mutate. So set just sets the value, uh, changes directly, update helps me to get the current value and modify that value. So in this case, I am taking the current value and adding four, if I need to do that, doing like an, uh, adding like a function for that value that I am receiving here. And mutate is really helpful for objects and arrays because I am changing a property for, for a signal that is, is its type is object or array. So we have a to-do to do, uh, signal, which has a title and a DOM properties. And when I mutate that value, I am say, okay, the property at zero position, I want to the property DOM to be true. So I mutate that, that thing. And I really like the use mutate because I am modifying that object. And I am mutated to a new state but I am preserving the other values from the signal. So I'm just modifying a, li a little property from that signal. You can use all of them depending on the need that you have here. So other thing for signals is that you can, um, you have other two things for signals and the other kind of signal is computed signal. This signal is read only, so you cannot override this conditional count signal here, but what you can do is reacting to those things. Like I have a show count and account signals, and when they change, I just react into that. Like a show count change, I am, every time show count is updated or changed in some way, I'm going to execute this function here, and I'm going to do whatever that I need to do here. This is going to be very explained on the example. And the effect, it's as it's it's name set it's a, a side effect and that helps me to i don't know like a following changes on on signal that i want to follow uh in a specific case sorry i'm just going to show the example here and make this a little bit better like uh just showing the example it's better to understand signals and rxjs i created an application here um with products so here I am, I just created a, a little page application where I have product, products and different product categories. So when I grab all the, I want to just see all of them. I just call this all. And if by category, I'm just filtering by categories here. So how this application was created, I'm going to just open here. Let me just close this. Uh, we have products. I created a product list, but this is the powerful thing of RxJS. I created, uh, if I go to the service, let me go first to the service. I created a call to an API where I'm getting all the products um, 
I also have a call to an, to the same API, just grabbing all the categories. I am grabbing also uh, filtering data by category here. So we are calling the API and saying, okay, I just get me these products from this category. Uh, and if you see here, I am using observables for these services. So we have, and the reason for, for being observable is although they are HTTP calls that just happen once at the time, I am wrapping as observable because they are data streams um, and we are getting things. An example for operators that I already mentioned on the presentation, I am mapping that information and just grabbing products because if the if you see the structures, I'm just going to show that uh, the way that I'm getting the data from the API is just like, uh, if you see, it's wrapped by, we have limit products and skip, and I just want to grab products from this object. So I am using an operator here to grab products from the API call. I just don't care. In this case, I just don't care the other property. So I'm just grabbing that information from that observable of the call to the API. Um, and we have another thing that is uh, waiting to create. So the thing with signals is that now we can uh, transform signals to observables and observables to signals. Why is that? Because signals are manipulated in a really easy way. I'm just going to show you in this other component. So that helps me to manipulate in a different way because if I want to like uh, manipulate observables, I have to create a subscription and a lot of things that maybe could be a little bit challenging at the beginning. So the power with signals is that I'm transforming an observable, which is working in a specific way. and creating a synchronous thing that I can manipulate better and easy, easier. So if I have the products here, let me just open this one. We are getting all product lists, products by category, product categories, um, and we have the selected product category. So this one is a signal. And for example, or for showing you how work with observables. I just have the product categories working. I am working with product categories as an observable just to show you how we can do in both ways, using signals or using observables. So product categories, once I get the product categories, I am creating here a subscription. Um, this pack here helps me to use the operators that I need to do let's say like uh, I want to filter this data in a way or map, all that all that operators, I just put it on the pipe um, here and the subscription. So I am subscribing every time product categories changes in any way, I just subscribe to that and I build in the categories list. So I just have a new product categories. Okay, I'm getting that information and I'm building the category list as the way that I need it for represented here in a way that I could just use it on the template. In the same way, I just using the information from products, but it's really different from subscribing. As you can see, all product list, I just listen for like I use here and I just get the data directly. And actually you can use it also directly on the template here and just have the product categories list. And I just say, this is a signal and this is an element that is behaving as um, reactively. So select the product category is changing directly. So every time I click on this one, I am updating that. I'm going to show you how that works using an effect. Um, so here I have an effect. I'm just going to uncomment it and then to import it. So the effect from signals helps me to like, a, I don't know, let's say that like I just want to see what is happening with the selected, um, selected product category signal. So if I change it and if, go, if I go to console, I say, okay, select the category is now skincare. If I change it tops, so I am following or listening for that thing of selected product category. I created a new signal that is computed type 
And I say, okay, if user selects, because I, am, I have two API calls different for all products and products by category. I just say like a if selected product category equals to none or empty string, which is like a all products, I get this all product list. If not, I just got the pro I just get the pro products by category list. So I am using here and I just in the product uh in the template, I just send in the product category list. Uh sorry, it's here. The product category list uh, sending to this component that I created just for represent the product list in a better way. So the thing is, this is a signal, and I am updating that signal dynamically according to the user interaction. So every time the user interacts, I am generating new effects, new events of data, but I'm manipulating or I'm reacting to those changes uh, in order to show or just display what the user needs in this case. Um, let me just uh, show you here. Uh, so we have, like a, as I already mentioned, two ways to react uh, to the API calls that I am doing for grabbing this, this data. One is by creating an observable, creating a subscription to that observable, by all, but also I am reacting by just using the, that information as a signal, like a transforming these uh, API calls to signals. So for example, for all products, I have an observable here, but I'm changing to signal. So I can just manipulate it in a different way in order to just get the data in a, I don't know, like a more easy way to get the information that is observable type. Um, but that's pretty much all the example. I, I don't know. I know that there's a lot of information I try to make as simple as possible. But if anyone has questions, I uh, just let me know. I just wanted to say the conclusions for all, all this exercise is reactive programming can be used in any application, not just Angular. You can use it for re, uh, React or other applications, as I, I'm not sure if in Vue you can also have the same one. There are a lot of libraries that help you to manipulate observables such as RxJS. Uh, RxJS is more used, I would say more used in Angular, but you have uh, several other libraries that you can use for reactive programming. So the, the main point here is that reactive programming is the way to like a work with information that the user is doing all the time. We have a lot of events in an application. Non-applications are not reactive because we are having a lot of events happening all the time on an application. Reacting to those changes is a really good way to do new changes, react to those information that the user is generating or the information that we are getting from an API, even for a server. So that's the power for reactive programming and using some libraries such as RxJS or using the power of signals is a really good way to get better application and more organized applications. I don't know if anyone has questions. <laughs> Thank you, Luisa. Uh, yeah, guys, if uh, someone has any questions, please unmute and ask. Could you go back to the application? I'm just wondering why do you need the list of all products? Yeah. Because they are all under some category. So why do you need all the products? Why do you need it? Uh, yeah, I created the application. Just let me show you here. All. Oh, you have all. Okay, okay, I got it. I have the old category, and actually, this API, this is a fake API that I used from, I don't know, it's for everyone who wants to test it. And they have an API for getting all or getting by category. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah, reason yeah. I, I got it. I yeah. miss it, the old, the old category, so it's fine. Okay. Guys, any, any uh, other questions? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for presentation. Uh, can you please open HTML for this uh, for this component? Yeah, mm -hmm. I had noticed that is it a, is it only single solution to use uh, uh, functions in template? Because I see that we have to call functions and uh, can we one... somehow avoid this? In this case, 
this is not a function, this is a signal. So I am getting the value. And yeah, you can actually take that value. I don't know, let's say like, a, in this case, it's similar to saying, I don't know if you are familiar with observables. Let's say like, a, let's say that this selected category is an asynchronous thing, an observable. It's similar to using a pipe assigned, uh, this one. It's a similar thing. I have an observable and I am getting the values asynchronously for that thing. It's not exactly a function. It, yeah, it's internally it's a getter function, but you can use it uh, directly here. If you don't want to make that API like uh, reacting to that change. Um, and actually, I totally forget to mention, sorry. And thank you for the question because the thing with this, um, signals is that Angular created a way for um, better change detection strategy. So they have a, a way that every time something changes on the template, they are refreshing the tree of change detection. When you have signals, you are saying, okay, I need to, every time selected product category changes, I want to fire a new cycle of change detection. So when you have a signal inside of the template, like this one, you are saying to Angular, okay, I need you every time I change something for selected product category, update this piece. And actually that's really helpful. The power of signals is that you are saying, I need to change this specific place. So that help us to improve the change detection process is not going to update the full component. It's just going to update that single thing. So if I am changing this little thing, it's not updating uh, like uh, all the things that I have here, I just updating this thing and the thing that is depending on that signal. Um, yeah, I know that's not a good practice to put functions on the template, but in this case is for the uh, for the change detection on the template. And actually, if you see on the Angular documentation said, if you put a signal in a template, you are like attaching the change detection tree to that specific place in the template. So this is a little bit different okay. from that. Got it, yeah. So does it mean that we have to set uh, on push strategy? Yeah, that actually this. they have like, a, you can use push strategy for signals. I haven't explored yet every, uh, that way, but you can use that for signals. Actually, I couldn't dig, a, like, uh, like I'll go a little bit deeper with that, but that is going to, I think signals is going to leverage the power to make change detection more um, specific and don't overload the application with a lot of happening when you just, we just don't need to update some, all the application every time something happens. Yeah, I read that, but I I couldn't say like a better explanation for that, but yeah, you can use it for that. Yeah, because like for me, without on push strategy, it, it looks like we, every time we will uh, execute the, that signal. Mm -hmm. That's why I have this concern. And actually just my opinion uh, that then it's strange that we have functions with name products list, right? And then it should be something like get products. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a strange to see it. Like a, what is a function called selected product category? That's a name of a variable and looks a little bit strange. Um, but yeah, that's the way to, to get the information from the signal. Um, another way that you can do it, if you prefer to do it, it's like, um, instead of do that, use a computed signal, like, uh, okay, selected product category change, and I just create, I don't know, like a constant here and I assign that value, like, a, I would say like a uh, category, uh, category here. And I just say, this is a string. And if every time selected category changes, what I can do here is just assign it directly, like a category. And I'm going to get in the computed signal here. Just, uh, I'm sorry, just totally forgot that this. And this category and update it like that. So I could, instead of using mm -hmm. that, just use it directly here. Okay, got it. Uh, 
I think um, in Angular documentation that said, okay, you can use it for, so internally for Angular is like uh, creating a tree for change detection. And I think it's not bad to use it, but if you prefer to use it like this, it's totally possible for do that. Because every time I change the selected category, I just use it like that. If you don't like to see it like a function call inside of a, of a template. Okay, I got it. Thank you for explanation. Thank you. Thank you for the question, actually. Thank you so much. I could explain that a little bit better. Thank you. So uh, maybe someone has another question. We have uh, two minutes. I have one minor question. Uh, you showed us that you uh, retrieve uh, all products via observable, right? And then you convert it, converted this observable to uh, signal. Mm -hmm. uh, in this scenario, do you need somehow to subscribe on this observable or just to use? Uh, That's the power of, of signals. For me, it was incredible to see it. Like uh, when the observable changes, actually, for example, here for product categories or I don't know, like anything else, every time changes, the change detection happens there. And every time the observable change, the signal is going to get the data updated dynamically. And so it's like an observable. It behaves like an observable, but you can manipulate that in a synchronous way. So I don't know, it's like a powerful thing for using signals. I see. So I guess that subscription is happening under, under the hood somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for, for listening changes, I don't know, like if you just want to listen those changes, you can have the effect or a computed signal uh, for like, uh, I don't know, I want to react to create a new thing, create an, another one. I would say in my personal opinion, I will st still use some observables for, because for me, it's more clear for subscribing changes, sorry, here, to subscribing and to reacting to those changes. Um, so I would say like, uh, you can use the power of both depending on the scenario that you are creating. In that case, like uh, creating a behavior subject for those changes and reacting to that. But signals behaves, I would say like uh, follows that example of observable pattern. 